guys, Jay here. Welcome to Models and Memories Weekly Episode 28. Models and Memories is a show about nothing and it is filmed in front of a live studio audience. And stay tuned all the way till the end to see a montage of painted minis courtesy of the EOB Complete community. This is a show where I talk about my painting, modeling, and wargaming experiences from the week and I end every episode with a story. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Jay, you put out three YouTube videos a week and you stream every single night. <sighs> How could you possibly have more to say? Well, I do, and here goes. This week, I spent a lot of time thinking about terrain, because I think, for me, terrain has never done what I want it to do. I kind of feel like terrain in this hobby is kind of the dirty little secret, where whenever people are like, oh, here's how you get into these games, and whether they're trying to tease you into how easy like a skirmish version of the game is, like Warcry or Kill Team, or they're trying to convince you that Age of Sigma or that Age of Sigma and 40k aren't as big and giant as they are, they always fail to mention the terrain, because in theory, you can get away without terrain. You can use, you know, bottles and cans and Paps Blue Ribbon and phone books and whatever you need to to build a game board, but it's never gonna feel right without like proper terrain or a proper setting. I mean, people do it every single day, but it's just tricky. Like terrain, terrain can become almost bigger and more expensive or trickier to have than the miniatures. Cause like the models are expensive and you paint them up and you figure out a, some way to store them, either probably a foam case or some sort of a, a tote box. But then you almost have, how do you deal with terrain? Like you almost need a whole shelf full of just stuff to be able to swap in and out on a giant game board. Terrain is a really, really odd thing. And Games Workshop sells a uh, really, really nice and really, really expensive terrain. There's MDF terrain available, like some of the stuff you can see behind me. And that stuff is pretty hard to build, but is somewhat uh, more affordable um, and more easier to get your hands on. There's tons and tons and tons of 3D printing options for the weirdos who love 3D printing. But there's no real solution like gamers are probably not going to spend an extra five hundred dollars to put together a, a game board out of 40k terrain most other companies maybe infinity offers a lot of terrain but most other companies don't really offer tons and tons and tons of terrain enough for you to really play their games it almost becomes you like a game you really are into malifa you're having a grand old time you've put together your armies your friends have put together armies, you've played on the kitchen table with salt packets and napkins, and you, you're, but now you're like, I really want to take this to the next level. I want it to feel like we're in the world of Malifaux, not just on my kitchen table. And so you're like, well, what, what do I do now? You go online and you're like, I guess I need a mat, and there's neoprene mats, there's cardboard mats, there's paper mats, there's uh, a lot, of, back in the day, you don't see much of this anymore, but people used to get green felt and green felt was a rolling hill landscape to play on. And then you just kind of search around to see like, maybe I want a, a train and a couple of saloon style buildings. And so you look that up and you find options and you get them shipped to you from all different corners of the globe. Terrain is a really, really weird thing to me. And maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just working myself into this weird psychosis of terrain, but isn't it weird that there are, there are, really, really concrete steps on how to build your armies or how to collect and how to play these games. Like, I want to play Kill Team. Well, you're going to need the rule book. You're going to need maybe, well, maybe that big box or maybe one box of Tau and you're going to need the, uh, the, the compendium rules. Like, th that's the things, those are the steps you need to play. Well, what are the steps I need to play with terrain? Oh, well, you know, um, you know, you could get like a set from Games Workshop and then maybe add some more stuff to it if you feel like it or you, yeah, just, you know, you know how to, eh. like that's, it, it just doesn't seem to be a great way to handle terrain, which is crazy because I think in a lot of ways, terrain is actually more important than, than like the game or the models. Uh, I, I'm, I'm playing a lot of Kill Team 2 which is a phenomenal game and I'm absolute, I absolutely adore the terrain system. It is such a clever system where you can use uh, engage or conceal orders that can change how you interact with terrain. So now it doesn't really matter if your guy is holding his sword straight up in the air, which was always kind of a problem because then everyone in the world can see him and shoot at him. 
Now, if he has a conceal order, he's actually ducking behind cover. So even if he is visible, he is not a valid target to shoot at. And that opens up an, a huge array of possibilities where you can kind of sneak around. And even if you're not completely behind, completely obscuring terrain, you are, it's, it's like another element of role playing where you're, you're, you know, you're got your hood up, you're sneaking around, you're going, you're, you know, you're crawling on your hands and knees so that the enemy can't see you and shoot at you. It really adds another layer to the game and it really benefits from tons and tons of quality terrain, which leads me back to, it's really hard to have tons and tons of really high quality terrain. Uh, a lot of people really, really get into the arts and crafts side of terrain building where they go to the arts and crafts store and they get themselves some foam core and some hot glue sticks and they really go to town and they make some really, really cool looking terrain out of garbage. But I feel like for me and my perfectionism and I need everything to be nice and I already have some Games Workshop terrain, I always feel like I really notice when I have my crappy homemade terrain next to like a beautiful Games Workshop terrain. And so I kind of want everything to everything to look really appropriate together. And another thing that really got me thinking about terrain is at all times, I'm always thinking about Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, which is a really ridiculously fun game that I used to love playing back when my Mac was able to support 32-bit programs and I was allowed to play games on my Mac, which I'm no longer allowed because Apple doesn't let me. But uh, I'm not, I'm not bitter, just disappointed. But uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 is a wonderful, wonderful game. And the maps, the maps make the game. I mean, think about Call of Duty without maps. There's like no game. There's like a really poor quality weapon simulator and then maps to play on. Like that's the whole game. And I mean, oh my God, those maps are fun. I mean, Estate, does anyone remember Estate? That map is just Capture the Flag. Or King of the Hill, like everyone trying to get to the top of the hill and take on the house, but one team usually is in the house and they get sniped or rocket launched or, ah, oh, it's just, what an incredible map. There's so much movement and accessibility. Terminal, Terminal is another absolutely wonderful map. Terminal is the map of choke points where the whole map is kind of like hallways and different areas where you can be, you know, your team can be in a room and all of a sudden they're really hard to get out of that room because everybody has to come through these doors and there's no real other way around it. You have to bum rush through those doors and you're gonna get massacred, but you might just get lucky and take out the enemy team. Scrapyard, Scrapyard would make an excellent kill team map because you got you got the one building on one side you got one building on the other and then you've got kind of open ground in between with tons and tons and tons of line of sight blocking cover in fact that's kind of an interesting thing that doesn't exist in a lot of uh, terrain for wargaming is like lanes terrain that kind of forces movements now the only thing that is kind of tricky compared to call of duty versus uh, tabletop games is even in tabletop games where you do get to do a fair amount of movement it's not like you can run 50 laps around the map in a game. You can run like 25 inches during an entire game. So you do have to give up some concessions of movement. You, they can't be quite as interesting as some of the Call of Duty maps. But uh, Rust, I mean, we all know Rust from Call of Duty. That map is insanity. It's a teeny tiny little map with one big building in the middle. And uh, in a normal game of like Call of Duty, I think like most players die like 20, 30 times in what, a two minute match or something. On Rust, it's like 50. It is insanity. Spawn die, spawn die, spawn die, spawn die. And there's like one or two spots on the map where you can be safe for a second until somebody runs up to you and knifes you. But it's crazy that, you know, what, way back in 2011, it seems like the developers of Call of Duty, a game where you run around and you try to shoot people, knew that terrain makes the game. There's there's no point to the game, to building the game if you're not gonna have amazing, perfect maps that are designed to force players to have fun and to interact with their environment and to interact with different with players in different ways, vantage points, sniping locations, no man's land, areas where you shouldn't go because you're gonna get shot, areas where you should go because you're gonna be safe. But when, when it comes to tabletop war games, and I mean, you know, part of the problem is it's a tabletop, but you, you slap down your mat and you got, you know, a couple of castles and maybe, you know, a couple of little clumps and then that's your terrain. 
I almost want to, to like take a, just giant piles of cardboard and recreate some of the more dynamic maps from video games and see if it at all translates. Like if I build like one of the cool maps from Halo or something, would that benefit a game like Kill Team or Necromunda or something? Like I bet it would. I feel like it really would if you have, because these things were designed in rent, basically around the same purposes. You know, sniping locations, shooting locations, close combat locations. I really do think there is something to really, really creating some interesting maps. I almost wish, it'd probably be pricey, but I almost wish some company out there, and maybe this exists, and if it does, please let me know in the comments. I wish that you could buy, like, maps. Like, you know, maybe MDF maps or something. Like, maybe a company says, this is a, this is a scrapyard world map. And, you, and it comes with the base and it comes with the train and you are supposed to set it up exactly how they tell you to set it up because that is the optimal layout to make the players engage and have an interesting game on the map. Because I've, I've played tons and tons of war games. I had a game recently of Star Wars Legion where I felt like the train just did me no favors and I got wiped before I really was able to do much to my opponents. And, but I feel like if, you know, if the game developers, the people who figure out this game, come up with the maps, they could come up with the maps that are really going to show off their game to the best, as opposed to just leaving it up to the day of the players. I mean, you know, you work really, really hard on your army and you get everything perfect and you're reading the rules and you're figuring out all your stratagems and you're figuring out all of your combos and maneuvers. And then when it's time to set up train, eh, okay, I'm gonna put one here, all right, all right, Billy put it here. And I put one right over here. We roll the dice for initiatives and play. It seems like it seems like we're all kind of dropping the ball when it comes to terrain. And I get why, because it is a really, really tricky thing to pull off. But I, I am gonna be, I'm gonna keep, be keeping terrain in the back of my brain at all times. And I'm really gonna try to come up with a really great solution. And please let me know in the comments how you handle terrain. Do you just go exactly by the rules of the games you play? Or do you just kind of decide with your opponent how things are going to set up or do you just take it upon yourself to always set up the train how it looks interesting do you do you know phone books and paps blue ribbons do you do you play on a kitchen table do you play on the floor how do you keep the cat away from the models you know however you do train i would love to hear your strats your six strats but this week uh, i did a lot of painting and i finished another squad of star wars legion i am Quickly chipping my way through Star Wars Legion. I am so close to not having a Star Wars Legion pile of shame. I have one Stormtrooper squad. I have one Death Trooper squad. And I have Luke and Darth Vader. But I might be saving Luke and Darth Vader for a little something special. But I finished a squad of seven Rebel Commandos. Uh, Star Wars Legion models come usually in boxes of seven. But squad sizes are four to six. Uh, and actually this makes two units. It makes a strike team and a commando team out of the box, which is really, really nice. So you get two units for the price of one box. But I've not been having tons and tons of fun painting my Rebels because it's just people in cloaks. And I think part of the reason is because of my style of painting and how I'll put on a Zenithal and then I'll put on some basic base coats, watery base coats. And then it's like, all right, now it's time to do all of the work and I have to be in complete control and I'm gonna layer and blend everything and the quality of the models is gonna rest solely on my ability to get buttery, buttery blends and cool transitions. And if I fail, it's because of me. And if I succeed, it's because of me. But I had another gosh darn squad of Rebels to paint, like my fifth, and I'm like, I don't, I don't wanna. And so I did something that I don't often do, but I compromised and I took a step back and I broke out the contrast paints. And I put on, I slapped on contrast paint. I took out my dry brushes and I dry brushed on the next few layers. And I produced models that are way better <laughs> than my usual fare when I force myself to do all of my own blends and highlights and have full control. I relinquished a little bit of that control and my models were much better for it. And part of the reason is because as good as I am at seeing that wrinkle of fabric and being like, okay, the highlight should be here and the shadow should be there. The sculptor has kind of already done all the work and wash paints and contrast paint and dry brushing 
kind of just does that, highlights those things automatically. So I, these models turned out really, really well. They didn't take that long. I, I compromise, I thought I was compromising, but really, I mean, these turned out better than the Rebels that I painted while in full control of my blends and paint jobs. And so I think that that has taught me a valuable lesson. And that lesson is to really examine the models and think about the best ways to achieve success as opposed to, all right, I have X model. It is time to take in my formula and, you know, these models plus my formula equals good product. It's not really true. You got to take into account what you're working with. I mean, usually on a rebel helmet, I would paint it brown and then I would paint it tan. And then I would very, very slowly over the course of like three steps, I would highlight every little ridge on the top of the head and then it would be done. But on these helmets, I just took contrast paint, one highlight, done. And it looks really good. It looks really good. So uh, yeah, I think sometimes it is, uh, it is, it is always good to try things out because I mean, I think a lot of people get into the habit of, well, I, this is how I paint my rebels. And you know, if I paint 10 rebels, I'm going to paint them this way. If I paint a hundred rebels, I'm going to paint them this way. But I think every squad of rebels I have is painted a little bit different and they all look a little different. They don't look perfect next to each other, but they all look okay. And I think these are actually the best ones. Uh, I've been a little down on contrast paint. I think a little bit because of how expensive they are and because I just don't know how to use them. But I think it might be time to give them another look. Maybe I'll pick up a few more colors and, uh, and see if I can use contrast to get more models done quickly and to a good standard. I definitely don't think uh, contrast is the be all end all. Like when, when we were first getting introduced to contrast, it seems like Games Workshop is kind of pushing the idea of you slap this on, you're pretty much done. It's not really true. It's like you slap this on, you have a really good base to work up from. That seems to be what contrast is really good at. But I can't really argue with the results. These look great. And I'm super happy with them. And I had a good time painting them. And uh, yeah, which I haven't been having a great time painting my rebels just because, you know, I did it once painting guys and cloaks. And then I had to do it so many more times. I kind of was like, I'm a little bit over this. But I had fun painting these guys, and I'm excited uh, to maybe get another squad and try out some more contrast paints. These guys I painted with a lot of tans and browns, so maybe I'll have to get some greens and see if uh, I can do a similar effect with green contrast paints. Although I really do love uh, Contrast Black Templar, the black paint, and Contrast uh, Apothecary White, which is a really, really good white paint. Black and white are annoying colors to do on miniatures, and I really, really like just slapping those on and uh, having it do most of the work for me. Really, really good paints, but I was wrong. These models are great. But these models and contrast paint is what I worked on this week. I'm super excited to see what I can do with contrast paint and it may turn into some interesting videos down the road. And if you like to see those videos or you just generally like the videos we produce, the best way to support us here at Eons of Battle is to become a member of our Patreon. Over there, you're gonna get access to some behind the scenes, voting about models I paint live here on YouTube, a live hobby hangouts every week, some STLs for terrain and more. But with that said, it's now time to move on to the story section of this week. And boy, do I have some models to show off for you guys. But I don't have them here. Uh, I'm going to be throwing up a montage of photos I took because this week I sold a lot of my models. <gasps> I know it, it shocked me. I've sold a a very small number of models here or there. I've done some commissions, which doesn't really count because those weren't my models. They were other people's. And I've sold a couple of painted models. I had a little Skitari army that I was working on for a few months that I decided I didn't want to play Skitari and I sold those. But uh, I sold all of my Space Marine Death Watch army. And boy, it felt, it felt a little emotional. Wrapping them all up in bubble wrap and getting them all ready to ship off. I would say that army was probably 70% painted, 30% uh, waiting to be painted, but I think that that army was always kind of destined to not manifest itself. Uh, it was cool and I did a lot of really quality paint jobs on it, but the reason I had it is because I bought tons of copies of Death Watch Overkill because I wanted a Gene Stealer Cult army and I have a Gene Stealer Cult army, it's awesome. But because I bought so many copies of Death Watch Overkill, I also ended up with a bunch of Death Watch models. And so I'm like, 
these guys are badass. I guess I should just go ahead and uh, buy the army, or I should I should get I should get more stuff for the army. And I I built up a lot, probably close to like three thousand points. It was lots and lots and lots and lots of models. But I was inspired. I saw a Squid Mars video of getting rid of some of his models, and he said something really interesting, where he said that. Having models around can be stressful if you don't feel like you're using them. And I'm like, that's insanity. I love all of my models. I need millions of models near me at all times. How on earth could that be true? But it's kind of true. Like those models, I didn't realize that they were causing me a little bit of stress. It was an army that I didn't really feel like building, but I had and I was obligated to build. I had purchased models for it, so... I should really get a move on painting and building those models. I had played with them in maybe two games of 8th edition ever. Uh, and it was kind of interesting, but I also have a Space Marine army. And boy, oh boy, do I not need a different color of Space Marines. And you know what's the funny part is it wasn't even a different color because I play Black Templar who wear black armor. And then I also had an army of Death Watch who also wear black armor. It was complete nonsense. I shouldn't have gone down that rabbit hole. But now those models are gone. The painted models are gone and the little twinge as those painted models go. But uh, I am super happy to see all of those gray plastic models go. Good riddance. Ah, it is nice. And it, I definitely want to get rid of more models. Because uh, now, now you know, I, I sold those models for some, for some cash, Ola. And so now I can take that money and I can put it towards the games that I am actively playing and I'm really excited for. Star Wars Legion, Malifaux, Kill Team, Age of Sigmar, maybe even get a little couple something somethings for my 40k armies, we'll see. Like, uh, that army was never going anywhere. Even if I hunker down and I did all of the work to get all of those models painted, it would just be a different color of Space Marines. And then I would sometimes play my Black Templar and I would sometimes play my Death Watch and it would still be the same thing because Space Marines are Space Marines. Uh, I think it's really, really cool that I got rid of those models. I it, I do when I was when I was packaging them up though. I, a lot of the memories of working on those models came back to me. I remember painting the Corvus Black Star in Milwaukee. It was one of the first models that I really like was proud of that I painted there. It was also a vehicle, which is pretty rare for me. I don't paint a lot of vehicles for some reason. The Space Marine Annihilators, those jump pack plasma guys. I wanted to paint something primary, so I got those guys and decided to add them to my army magnetizing all of my Death Watch uh, Terminator Space Marines. There was a lot to that army. It also had tons and tons of Space Marine bikes. It had close to 30 Space Marine bikes, which is absurd. And I was really excited to one day be the, the, the Death Watch biker guy. But you know what? It's not meant to be. I'll be the Orc biker guy, because I already have 15 painted up Orc bikers. Only five more to go, and then I'll have my full army. It'll be glorious. Getting, getting rid of some projects that are no longer feasible or interesting. I think I think you shouldn't just like, things shouldn't be coming and going. Like you should really know what you want. Cause like you shouldn't just be like, I haven't played this army in two months, it's gone. Uh, but that army was years old. And, I, and over the course of the years, I had never even landed on like a finished version of it. Like I had half of it painted in one scheme. And then I had another half of it painted in a slightly different scheme. I never really nailed down what I wanted from that army, and that army existed through like three different editions. It was collected in 7th edition, 8th edition, and 9th edition, and uh, yeah, there was no more points. So I put it all in a great big box, slapped a shipping label on it, and sold it. And it feels good. It feels good. I might have to do some more of that. I rewatched my video on uh, where I talked through my pile of shame, and you know what? The pile of shame has decreased a little bit. A little bit, and I think that's good. I think uh, I think I'm gonna make myself some lists of maybe models that can go in the future, and it'll be good. But yeah, good old models, good old memories, and uh, good riddance to my Death Watch army. But that brings this episode of Models and Memories to a close, and it is now time for the real star of the show. This week's EOB complete submissions. 
We put out a challenge to our community to send us before and after photos of their recently finished models to be immortalized in our videos. If you want to join in the fun, you can submit a before and after photo of your painted mini to our Discord server, which you can find in the description below, or you can post it to Instagram with the hashtag EOBcomplete. Without further ado, let's look at and get inspired by what the folks have finished this week. A Star Wars Legion Saber Tank by Pippo, an Orc Warboss by CT1409, a Sci-Fi Soldier by Elijah D. Prophet, a 40k Custodes Army by ProTech, an Eldar Grav Tank by Foxpelt, some Squig Hoppers by Wombat74, a Great Big Orc Stompa by Soggy Cat, a Space Marine Lieutenant by Meh, an Orc Morkonaut by Ryoganox, an Assault Intercessor by Roginus, a Very Nice Base by Andy Crimson, a Very Special Orc by Stinky Pete, a Vanguard Space Marine Box by Brother Captain Aurelian, a Stormcast Veteran by Katoshi Lucero, a Sister Superior by Bear Boy, a Commando Orc Boy by Disco, a Corn Chieftain by Boo Thang, some Primary Space Marines by Lord Shaper, a Death Watch Veteran by Bloody Magpie, an Imperial Guard Waverin by Chukka, some Primaris Intercessors by Trax, a bunch of Tau Drones by Emil33, a Magical Wizard by Mytho, a Bane Blade Repaint by Ian190764, some Chaos Space Marines by Ergo, a Classic Dragon by Master Builder75, a Space Marine Librarian by Lucifer, and some Goblins by El Tio. Congratulations to everyone for a job well done. It's no small feat to get paint on minis and you all should feel really proud. Nothing gets the hobby juices flowing like finishing a project and we all thank you for sharing your work, motivating us and the hobby community to paint our plastic. Thanks for sharing.